We'll begin with an implementation that's very simple. So when I say an implementation of sets, we're going to not commit to a particular representation, but instead change the representation throughout the lecture. But make sure that we're implementing the same behavior each time. So this is a form of data abstraction. So the first thing we're going to try is the simplest version we can think of, which will also have very simple implementations in terms of the number of lines of code that we have to write and how much we have to think about it. And that is just to represent a set as an unordered sequence. And to represent sequences, we'll use recursive lists, the same implementation that we had before. Let's just quickly remind ourselves what that looks like. So uh, here is, from lecture 17, the rList class, which takes some first element and then the rest of the list on construction. And remember that the rest of the list either has to be an rList itself or the special value rList.empty. rList.empty is just some object that has length zero. Okay, so a set is represented by a recursive list that contains no duplicate items. That's a reasonable way to represent a set. So let's introduce a function that we'll use throughout lecture, empty, which takes uh, a recursive list S and tells us whether it's the empty list or not. Okay, so how will we define whether a set S contains a value V if S is a recursive list that contains no duplicate elements. Think about it for yourself a second, and then we'll look at the implementation. First, if S is empty, then V is definitely not in S. Otherwise, if V is the first element of this set, well then V certainly is in the set. Otherwise, we don't know, which means we're gonna have to make a recursive call. And the recursive call is to set contains. It asks whether V is in the rest of the set. So if V is in there, it's either the first element, which we check for, or it's in the rest of the set. And if it's not in there, then we'll keep recursing until we reach the empty set, and then we're done. So if I go to the top of the file, I see exactly the implementation I just showed you. The empty function and then set contains, which checks if S is empty, checks if we've already found v or otherwise recurses. And here are two test cases. So in all of these test cases, the set s is 1, 2, 3. So if we ask whether 2 is in 1, 2, 3, we'll get the answer true. And how do we do that? Well, let's trace it to find out. So set contains on s, passing in 2, Call set contains on this entire R list and the number two. Now one is not two, so then we make a recursive call on the rest of the list, that's two, three. We find that the number two is in fact the first element of that, so we return true. And since this returns true, and this function just returns whatever this returned, we get true for the whole thing. So that's why we return whatever happens when we recursively call set contains. Set contains five is a little bit more work. We have to go through all of the different elements in the list until we finally reach our list.empty, and then we know that finally that value five is not in there anywhere. So then we work our way all the way back up by returning from each call to set contains until we eventually return false overall. Let's remember what orders of growth are. For a set operation that takes linear time, we say that n is the size of the set and the resources used by some operation is r of n. So in this case, we'll think about the number of steps required to perform the set operation that we care about. And we can write the resources used for a set of size n is big theta of n. And n is an example function that we might use within theta. Now, this is not an equality. This is a very different beast. What this expression means is that there are some positive constants k1 and k2 such that 
the actual resources used, the number of steps required, is bounded between k1 and k2 for sufficiently large values of n. So searching through an entire list and not finding the element that we want takes linear time because there's some constant number of operations required for every single function call. And we have to make n of them because we have to look through the entire list. So if we think about sets as unordered sequences, we can also implement the other behaviors that we're interested in, not just set contains. So set contains is theta n, runs in linear time. How about a join set? So what does that do? Well, it takes in a set S, which in our current representation is a recursive list with no repeated elements. It takes in some value V, and it returns a set that contains all the elements in S and V, but no repeats. Okay, think about it for a second before I show you the implementation. So how this works is we can ask if set contains SV. If it does, well then S already has V in it, so the adjoined set is just S. Otherwise, we can build a new recursive list with V on the front. How much time does it take in order to do this? Well, we have to call set contains. That's a linear operation. This is a constant time operation because we're not changing anything or looking through the entire list S. All we're doing is creating um, a new object which has a first and a rest element and we don't have to copy or anything like that. So this is a constant time thing, but this is linear time, set contains. And so the whole thing is gonna take that much time because we have to search through the entire list to see whether this element is there. And remember that n refers to the size of the set. How do I intersect two sets where each one is represented by a recursive list with no repeated elements? Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna define a new function, which takes in a value and tells me whether that value is in set two. And we'll call that function in set two. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna filter the set one list with the function in set two. What does filtering do? Well, it returns only the elements in set one for which this function is true when we evaluate. So remember what filter our list is way down here. Here's filter our list. So filter the elements of S by some predicate function that we pass in. So if for instance, we had S is one, two, three, and we were testing whether something was odd, it would return all of the odd elements through the recursive implementation that we looked at two lectures ago. So this filtering is a linear time thing meaning it goes through every element and tests whether the function applied to that element is true or not. Whether or not it's true, we have to recurse on the entire rest of the list, which means that it's a linear time effort. So how long does it take to intersect two sets? Well, increasing the size of the sets by one actually incurs an entire n more work. Why is that? If I had one more item to filter, then I have to call set contains on that item. And that set contains call means that I have to look at all n elements of set two. So intersecting sets is theta n squared. So remember the reason I knew it was n squared was that when the problem size grows by one, the amount of work I have to do grows by n. That's a quadratic order of growth. The implementation of union set, well, take set one and set two, comes up with a function, which is true if some value is not in set two. Now, why do we want that? Well, we wanna create a set that's got all the elements of set two, as well as all the elements that are in set one, but not in set two. So we can get the elements that are in set one, but not in set two by filtering set one, with this function that checks whether things are not in set two. And then we can combine all the elements in this set one but not set two set and set two itself. This is also theta n squared. 